Well, it's my great pleasure to um, to introduce uh, Anna for this keynote because uh, actually it's thanks to Anna that I've been working on sketch-based modeling over the past 10 years. So it's a way for me to thank her <laughs> for introducing me to this topic. Uh, but sketch-based modeling is just one of the many topics on which uh, Anna Schaeffer worked. Uh, in particular, she made significant contributions to uh, surface parameterization, surfacing and meshing, garment capture and design. Uh, and maybe more related to this uh, workshop, vector graphics, and recently VR sketching. And so in total, she published more than 40 papers in ACM transactions on graphics, most being presented at uh, ACM uh, CGraph. And, and this is really outstanding. I think it's an impressive number. And for all those contributions, uh, Ala Schaeffer was elected a, uh, elected a fellow of the Royal Soci Society of Canada. And she also recently joined the prestigious SeaGraph uh, Academy. And uh, Knowing Anna Schaefer, I think that what motivates her to work on all those topics is the combination of beautiful images, elegant math, and also a deep insight uh, on visual perception. And I'm sure that we'll have a flavor on, of that uh, in her talk. So, Ala, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you, Adrian. Okay, I think I have to try and match all those expectations. <laughs> and what I'm going to talk about today is the challenges which are inherent to processing artist drawn imagery. And for that, let's take a step back and think about, let's say, one of the big areas where we have a lot of image processing methods, and those are natural images. And when we think about natural images, well, we have real data, right? You have photographs of real life actions, real life scenes. So when we create new natural images, so GAN methods and things like that, our goals are to achieve realism, so to create things which look real and to achieve correctness. As in, because we're dealing with real data in natural imagery, we can actually measure whether what you are creating is right. And that, in many ways, makes natural data very well suited for learning because you have realism and you have correctness and you can compare against stuff in the real world and say whether well, things are right in a very concrete way. I mean, does your dolphin look like a dolphin? Well, we can find an actual real dolphin, measure it and compare our output against it. When we talk about artist drawn images, what makes them different is that this is synthetic, that this is human created inputs. And therefore, no, we don't have a measurement of realism because human may create stuff which doesn't exist in the real world. We also don't have a measurement of correctness because we don't know what was the content created. And more importantly, that's not necessarily the metric we want to use. I would argue that the metric we want to use when we look at artist-drawn imagery is consistency with your expectations. Basically, question we want to ask is not whether this drawing here depicts a shape correctly, but whether this the reconstruction that we are going to make out of this drawing, this 3D object will create algorithmically, is it consistent with what you as viewers expect? So there is no metric of correctness. The metric is consistency. So here are some examples of tasks where we want to say, what do humans want? Here is a raster input image. Here is a zoom on that raster, just so you can see it a little bit more clearly because this is probably really tiny on the screen of your laptop. And if we want to vectorize it, probably in your head, you can imagine what the vector out of this task would look like. So what we want our algorithm to do is to match that output that you're currently imagining. Or oh, another example. We have a drawing which an artist created using raw overdrawn strokes. If I was to ask you what the outlines of the different regions in this drawing are, again, you can imagine those in your head. What we would like is an algorithm which will match your expectations. So this is kind of what I talk about when I talk about processing artists generate. Is the goal is to match what humans expect. And a key observation is the type of tasks we are interested in are tasks where we as humans know what to expect. So inherently, those are not ambiguous. 
we as observers know what we want to get. The question is, how do we express this goal algorithmically? Because once we can express the goal, well, then we can hope to solve the problem. But our first task is to actually formulate or codify the human expectation. How do we measure success? Once we can measure success, we can now try and solve. Solving the problem may still be very, very hard, but I strongly believe that this part, just formulating what we actually want in many ways is often harder. So how do we find out what humans expect? What we really want is to somehow capture this human expectation or to learn human perception of this human made imagery. And the question is how? So what I will do in this talk, I'll look at some representative problems in this space and the different tools one can use to address those problems and the common threads between those tools. So here is an example, it's a recent paper, well, a couple of years back, of how do we understand, how do we go from 2D to 3D? Here are two drawings. How do we create the 3D object which those drawings depict? And well, one idea is to learn from synthetic data. Because as we said, we need to learn what people expect. And the argument that was made in this paper was, well, NPR rendering is a pretty good sketch proxy for human sketching. Therefore, we can think of the problem of going from a drawing to a 3D model as the inverse of the problem of going from a 3D model to a drawing. And if that is the case, well, hell, we can now generate lots of data like that, right? We can generate lots of training pairs of 3D objects and their sketches, and then use a learning method to go in the opposite direction. And here is the architecture of that method. I'm not going to go into details here, but the core idea is that once we have lots of training data, hey, we can now just invert the process and train on that data and get an algorithm which goes in the opposite direction. And it works reasonably well. However, if we look at this data, what the challenges are? The good thing about synthetic data, there's lots of it. It's easy to generate, but it's not the same as human data. So yes, we can go from NPR drawings to 3D models, but if you show a human this model, they are not going to create these drawings. This is synthetic, right? This is inherently very different if you look at those drawings than how humans normally draw. Now, we can train the users. Humans are very smart. You can make humans use the drawing style that your machine learning system expects. However, that's not as great, right? Because we would like to be able to process drawings drawn by people without training them first to fit our algorithm. And very often also the case is that it really is almost unrealistic to train them because the data is just inherently different. So the challenge is, and it's kind of interesting because it was already mentioned in the questions and in the summaries of the previous talks, is that what we want is to somehow learn what humans want from humans. So we do not want to pretend that synthetic data is equal to human data. We want real human data. So how do we do that? How do we learn from humans? So let's look a little bit at this problem of 2D to 3D in the wild, as in how do we get there one step at a time? So the methodology I'm going to very much argue here for is to study how people draw and how people perceive drawings and then try to formulate this if knowledge as constraints or objective. That's a methodology we have used in a series of papers. I'll then move forward and talk about also 
how do we incorporate data in these setups? But let me start with a data-free environment in a way. So let's look at 2D to 3D. There are really two stages in this process. You go from freehand strokes, where people use overdrawing, where if you look closely, intended curves are drawn using multiple strokes to a very clean network of 2D curves, where network means we have connections, we have full information, and then we go to 3D. So let's look at this 2D problem. And the problem is, you have seen this drawing a few minutes ago. We have this human drawing, which is freehand, where people draw strokes. And when people draw freehand, they use overdrawing, mainly. They you depict the same curve using multiple strokes. As viewers, we immediately see what they intended. In other words, what we see is we see this implicit correspondence between groups of strokes and curves. And Let's ask a fairly simple maybe question of how do we algorithmically go from here to here? And if we break this problem into stages, we can think about it as first figuring out which groups of strokes correspond to a curve and then fitting curves. We have a paper which is very recent where we do this fitting step and I'm not going to talk at all about how to do this. What I wanted to talk a little bit is about this step, because this is where some observations or some techniques for how to understand what humans want come into place. So if we look at overdrawing drawings, if you look at these three little snippets here, in your head, it's immediately clear to you how you would group the strokes. Probably this was the grouping you made in your head. Now let's try and go back to perception knowledge, to human perception studies, and specifically Gestalt psychology, and see if those studies can tell you something about the grouping you do in your head. For instance, on this drawing, which is a bit more complicated. And let's look at the cues humans employ. Something which is very basic, but still needs to be said, is if we look at groups of, if we look at strokes, which when they are side by side have very different tangent directions, we expect them to depict different curves. That's kind of fairly straightforward. A somewhat less straightforward question is how far from one another can strokes be in order to be considered as belonging to the same or different clusters? And this is an interesting one because really we are not talking about absolute distances, but relative. So in this, zooms here, this one comes from here, and this one is here. This distance is exactly the same as this one. Yet here, as human observers, we see those orange strokes as being together, yet we see those ones as being two groups. And if you look at Gestalt psychology, it gives you some interesting hints, because what it says is that people look at relative proximity. When you have a group of objects which have roughly the same distance between them, and then there is a big jump in distance to the next group, then we end up grouping the first ones together. And here, this is kind of the same example, but it's a slightly different setup again. The red strokes have very small distances between them, and then there is a big jump. And anytime we see a jump in distance, mentally, we separate things. So that's another very strong cue, which tells us how people do mental grouping. Another one which is also very interesting is narrowness. If we look at these curves here or the strokes, they come here, I did a zoom from the feet of this guy. The distances here are in fact very similar to the distances here if you look at the actual drawing. Yet when we look at these strokes here, we don't see them as conveying a curve. Why? Because as a group, the width of this group is bigger than its length. So there is a certain ratio of length and width which comes into play when we decide whether a group communicates a single stroke or a single curve or not. Now, using these cues, we can come up and we had in our setup with an algorithm which does indeed this type of classification that you had done in your head. And I'm not going to go into the details of the algorithm itself, 
Because what we do is we do a course to find analysis and we use the cues that I had just mentioned in the different steps of the analysis. Once we have the grouping, we can compute the fit. So this is an, an example where what we are using is not data, but cues which comes purely from perception studies, but then adapt them to our specific application on it. There's one small thing. I mentioned that we have this notion of angle where we somehow decide how far things can be angularly to be apart or together. What does it mean for relative proximity? What's the ratio of the different gaps between different objects? Or what does it mean to be narrow? Like at what point is it narrow? Is a group narrow enough to be seen as a curve? And when is it too wide to be seen as a group, which is not a curve? How do we get those thresholds? Because this is thresholding algorithms, literally, right? There's a thresholding involved. How do we get there? Well, sometimes we can get lucky. Perception literature, for instance, gives us strong research on shows at what point people no longer see curves as parallel. For other things, in our work, we have done perception studies to try and find those criteria. Like for instance, to realize that yes, when this gap here is sufficiently small compared to this one, human observers see those two strokes as being grouped together while this one as being a standalone. Or at what point do we start seeing something as a thick curve versus a rectangle, namely an object which is too thick to actually be a curve. So that's something that can be done. So you look at perception and you look at perce perceptual cues or principles, but then in order to quantify them, you need to have some perception study element to understand how to convert those into things you can quantify. So principle threshold setting is kind of that word I would use to describe something like this. Now, how do we go from 2D to 3D? And here I'm going to go back a little bit in time to the first paper with Adrian. And how do we again use perception principles to go from a 2D drawing to a 3D shape or to a 3D content? And here in this work, we didn't go as far as to go to an actual 3D model, but we went to a point of getting the shading which communicates the normals on this drawing. Once you have those normals, you can do all kinds of cool operations on the drawings. And the core idea in this work was to look at how artists draw. So rather no, we look at both perception as into how observers perceive things. But here, this was kind of one of the first look papers where we looked at what do artists do? Because the core assumption is when artists make certain drawing choices, they make them to make the drawing maximally clear to the viewer. So what we asked was, what do artists do in order to make their sketches effective? And what we noticed is artists use cross-section lines in their drawings and they use them a lot. And cross-section lines, are not random. They have certain very strong properties. They are, they are usually, they are, they are drawn such that both the curves and its planes that those curves are in, in 3D space are orthogonal. And they also draw curves, which are often symm convey symmetry lines, and the artist choose views with minimal foreshortening. Once we have these observations, we can quantify them and come up with an optimization framework in which we look at those curves and we find the best suited interpretations. So we can go from curves to the normals on your surfaces and then to shaded drawings. Now, are we done? Well, no, because this data is extremely clean. You may notice that the curves here have different colors because every color corresponds to a different meaning. And this is extremely clean and we have a lot of annotations so of the curves. So how we go to data in the wild. And the next step we did was still quite a while back, that's SIGGRAPH 14. And we took drawings 
which you know, were not exactly these drawings. We took drawings which look like this one. So this is much closer to a human drawing. It's still quite clean. And we now went from this drawing where we do know the intersections in the drawing and we can go to a 3D curve network. How? Well, inherently, we now have no annotation, but, and we account for two things. For the fact that in real drawings, regularities are selective. They don't happen everywhere. And drawing are never exact. Humans, even when they intend to draw things which are, for instance, parallel, are never going to draw them parallel. When people intend to draw stuff which in 3D is orthogonal, in their 2D drawing, they're not going to draw an exact projection of an orthogonal drawing. So we have those regularities which were observed in the previous paper, but they are selective, and we need to account for inexactness. In other words, yes, while 2D curves should reflect 3D curves, they are not going to be perfect. Yes, we expect the 2D curves to be pretty close to the 3D curves, but not a perfect projection. And we expect the shape of the 2D curves to be close to the shape in 3D. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's say you, I'm tell you, this is a view of a 3D curve network. You can imagine in your head now, how those curves probably may look. This is not what you expect, right? These curves, they're plausible. This is a view of this network, but this is not what you expect. And as artists, an artist is not going to choose this view for this network. They may, however, choose this view for this network. And in our paper, we account for this in the energy function we use during our reconstruction. So, we can go now much further. We can go from a 2D drawing to a 3D network. However, we are still making very strong assumptions on the data. We assume that we have all the connections. We know that this is an intersection and this is just an occlusion. And we assume that the data is extremely clean. There's no overdrawing. So that part can be partly solved by the paper I discussed earlier, where we can go from an overdrawing drawing to one which is clean. But now let me take a big step forward. So SIGGRAPH Asia 2020. And the first author of this paper is Yulia, who is the chair of this section. Yeah, Yulia. And this is, I think, a really cool work because it takes this idea of looking at what artists do and how artists draw a huge step forward and does it Yet again, we're just using knowledge or, knowledge or understanding or reasoning about how artists draw and how human observers perceive those drawings, rather than, let's say, a data-driven approach, given the fact that we don't have data. We don't have correspondences between those drawings and exact 3D objects. So how do we go in this paper about reasoning about the drawing? The key observation of this paper is artists use scaffolds. When they draw, they don't immediately draw a complicated 3D shape. They start with a scaffold, which helps them to draw. Now notice that that scaffold can also help us as observers or us as an algorithm to understand the shapes that they draw. Because the scaffold in many ways has very regular characteristics. And those can be used for building up the model using the same sequence of operations as the one used by the artist. So what we have here is we have the scaffold which has lots of axis aligned lines and you have very clear three axes. You do have some non-axis aligned lines, but the axis aligned ones give you a lot of cues that you can use you also have curves, but yet again, you have a lot of lines. Lines are easier to reconstruct than curves. And we can use the lines to then reason about the curves. The second part, which I kind of mentioned, is drawing order matters. Artists use previous strokes to anchor 
to anchor new ones. So as they draw, they use the information incrementally. And we, when we build our algorithm, can leverage that order. So the key idea in the paper is that if we have straight line 3D connectivity and actual alignment, we have a unique 3D geometry. So if we get this type of drawing, we know that all of these lines are straight and we can group them based on one of the three major axes they're aligned with. If we know the connectivity, as in let's say, this is an intersection, this is not, we now can fairly straightforwardly get the 3D geometry. So our challenge really, the problem of reconstructing 3D from 2D can be reduced to a, to a Boolean connectivity or discrete problem. Figuring out whether each one of the points where we have two curves intersecting 2D, is that a real 3D intersection or not? So we can convert this continuous problem into a discrete one. And discrete is usually easier to solve. And in order to detect connectivity, we rely again on cues which we observe both from perception literature, but also from how artists draw. And I already mentioned some of them. One is axis alignment. A lot of your straight lines are going to be aligned with axis. Another very interesting one is when people draw using scaffolds to draw from outside inside, they often start with this big bounding box of your object and then they start adding details and they do it very gradually. Anchoring, so the idea that when people draw strokes and they add them to an existing drawing, they typically anchor them. So it's very reasonable to expect that any new stroke is going to have one or more actual 3D intersections with the existing ones. We also use minimal foreshortening. That's something I mentioned earlier. And that's the idea that artists choose views in which the line, the length of your different curves in 2D are proportional to their length in 3D. They are not going to choose views where some curves are extremely foreshortened. And there are some other cues we use. If you want to look at the details, you can look at the paper. But the core idea is to use incremental reconstruction and to reason about <coughs> which of the 2D intersections of every new curve are likely to be 3D intersections. So here are three options, for instance, here. We have the three curves, which are the, the existing ones, which are already intersect, which are already reconstructed. So this new straight line can potentially only have these three potential configurations. And clearly by looking at this one, drawing here, you and our algorithm will opt for this option because it's more consistent with the cues I had mentioned earlier. And so using this approach, we can do pretty cool stuff. We can go from this sketch to a 3D rotated view or from this sketch to rotating it and then actually scaling it. So this gives us a lot of kind of forward on how do we go to 3D from 2D. However, this is only a first step. Our method is far from perfect. And the challenges are that while as a human, you immediately notice when something is wrong. If this is your input view and you then rotate it, and this orange curve here is sitting over here, as a human observer, you'll go, ah, that's really, really, really wrong. However, how do we get to account for that algorithmically is where the challenge becomes. On the one side, humans are extremely sensitive to errors in the algorithm. On the other side, it's very hard to create ground truth. We actually had humans manually annotate, for instance, wrong strokes in our drawing. So that's a much easier problem than actually creates with the geometry manually from a drawing. And it took people 15 to 20 minutes to even just annotate what's wrong in the reconstruction. So creating ground truths in this type of setups is really hard. And let me move a bit forward and go back to this clip art vectorization problem I mentioned again at the beginning of my talk. 
And here the challenge is we go from raster, we want to vectorize. Now, the raster we are looking at is generated by humans. Namely, it's a raster which has a very clear mental vectorization, right? So there is a clear notion of what is right and what is wrong when we look at this drawing. And we addressed this paper in a, this problem in a couple of recent papers. And so this is the solution we come up with. So this is where we go from a raster to a vector. The question is how and why is this hard? So when, and let's talk again, what is the metric of success in this work? The goal is to match human expectations. If this is the raster, you can again probably imagine in your head what the vector should look like. Look at those four drawings for a second for vector outputs and think which one of them you as an observer would like to get. Here are, here are the methods that these outputs correspond to. I would kind of hope that this is what you imagine or this is the one which is most consistent with your personal expectations. So how do we get here? Like what happens when we go from a raster to a vector? And how do we learn this? Because this is a space where Gestalt psychology or other insights are really not adequate because yes, we can use some of them, but it's often not enough. So intuitively, if we want to learn from data, well, we can learn from pairs of raster and vector images, right? If you're a learning person, if I have pairs like that, I could just train on them. One option could be, well, learn from vector images and their esterizations. So here is a sterilization of a vector image. I'm assuming in your head, you can imagine what the vector input looks like or what the vector that you would like to see looks like. Is this what you imagined? If I vectorize, if I rasterize this, rounded cube, this is what I would get. However, as an observer, if I were to look at this raster input and you as an algorithm were to produce this, I would probably be pretty upset. Why? Because this is not consistent with what I as a human expect. Because humans make certain assumptions about data. This is where perception literature even hints at what kind of assumptions we are likely to make. So training use on this pair is just not going to give us what we want because it's going to give us results which humans will really not like. Inversion inherently is not useful, partly because multiple vector inputs will give you the same raster. So we are trying to invert an uninvertible problem and we want the right inversion, the one which is consistent with what people would give us. Well, we can also have artist-generated vectorizations. Something a lot of current research is looking at is, well, let's have humans generate correct outputs and then use those. The problem with this type of approaches is they are expensive. Going from this raster to this vector, those are very simple shapes. It took an artist on average on the inputs we ask them to vectorize, 30 to 45 minutes. Yes, you can generate maybe a hundred examples. You really probably cannot afford, unless maybe you are a very rich company to generate a thousand. It would be nice if you could, if you had infinite money, but paying artists to generate a thousand objects where each one takes at least half an hour will be a lot of money. So the solution we argue for is a hybrid. So the idea being, we want to have as much leverage as possible of perception priors, because we do know a lot of stuff about how humans perceive sex. And then to combine those priors with human data, ideally non-expert data. Why? Because expert time is more expensive. And we want to minimize the amount of human data that we need, okay? So how do we get there? Well, let's look at what we know from perception. We know that when people look, let's say, at a raster image and mentally imagine what the vector is, they do expect the vector to be pretty close to the raster in terms of just absolute distance. So they expect accuracy. 
We also know, and this is where Gestalt psychology comes in very strongly, is that people seek for simple explanations. If we see a straight line, we expect to see a straight line in the output. If we see a sharp 90 degree corner, we expect to see it. So this is not simple. Human observers prefer simpler interpretations. At the same time, what makes this problem more challenging is humans also convert discrete data into continuous. So given this lovely ducky, which is a polyhedron, and this one, which is piecewise continuous, human observers prefer this. So you can already start seeing the challenges because now all of a sudden we have conflicting cues. Lastly, people strongly regularize. For instance, if they have data which can be interpreted as symmetric, they prefer a symmetric interpretation of a non-symmetric. The challenge is that those cues conflict. Here are two raster images. You have seen both of them earlier. And in your head, you can imagine what you want to look like, the output to look like. So here are four options. Two options for this input, two for this one. My guess is this is what you prefer. But if you look at them, they conflict with respect to the cues I mentioned earlier. These two are more accurate, but yet here we prefer a less accurate interpretation. At the same time, those two are more continuous, yet here we prefer this less continuous interpretation. So we have this challenge of balancing different perceptual cues. And that's where data comes in very handy. And that's why we are, we are looking for hybrid approaches. And in the 2018 paper, what we had done is we had the humans focus on detecting where the discontinuities are or where the curve, the output should not be continuous. And then we tried to learn from discontinuity annotations what where the corners in our reconstruction are and then to fix splines. As it turns out, it's not as effective partly because human detection of corners is actually not very reliable. Different people end up placing corners in different places, and it's very hard to generalize as a result to different resolutions or to different types of drawings. In the more recent work, what we had noticed is that we can break the problem of fitting a spline to a raster into two steps. One is fitting a polygon, and then going from a polygon and fitting a curve. The big advantage was that in order to compute a polygon which fits a raster, we don't actually need human data. We can use purely perceptual cues and convert this problem into one of finding the shortest cycle in a graph where the shortness of the length of the cycle is defined using a function which is purely based on perceptual principles. Then in this step here, we're using learning. And the advantage is that we have less, with less human input, we can achieve better quality. So the core idea of the learning is going from the polygon to the fit. We can literally look locally at neighborhoods around each polygon corner. And the number of such corners across all polygons is in some ways, in terms of characteristics, much smaller. Therefore, we can learn this type of maps from fairly small data sets. So the idea of maps means that I look at the neighborhood around the corner and I look at the possible fits. So for instance, I can keep a corner as sharp or I can fit a corner using a single smooth curve or I can fit it using a smooth curve as a line. So you have fairly small set of options, and you can train a classifier to go from corners to one of those three. And those classifiers, as it turned out, can be very efficient. We have a very small set of features. We use a total of 10 features per corner, and we have a very high success rate in predicting things which are consistent with what people expect, just given 23 inputs. So that's a very, very small data set. That's something you as a user can provide very easily. 
Now, this brings me to an important question, which I kind of swept under the rug so far, which is, so how do we measure success when we talk about methods which try to match humans? And the answer in our work is often is, well, you look at pictures. However, that's not enough because especially where the authors like their own pictures does not count. What we want to look at is a perceptual studies. So you want to go and ask a lot of human observers, do your outputs look right? And typically the way you do it is by asking comparative questions on your outputs versus others. So if I look at take home message, that my take home message from this talk is that processing artist drawn imagery, the success is measured as alignment with human expectations. And luckily for us, there is already quite a bit of research on what humans expect. So we do not need to reinvent the wheel. We can look at perception research and we can look at domain knowledge. We can also use data and data is extremely important. Data is important both as observational and quantitative studies and also machine learning type data. So pairs of ground truth data and inputs. The challenge here is, well, there is a yes, but, is we need to understand how to create collections of reliable ground truth data. So it's not, it's real data we can trust. And the one challenge is often that creating such data is very hard. So we can going forward still have to deal with the fact that reliable ground truth data is going to be sparse and often it will be indirect namely asking people for instance for raster and vector it's very hard to generate but maybe we can ask people simpler questions and then use that information and i will stop here because we are over time thank you for your attention thank you Ella. i got nice images, elegant math and perception. So that's exactly what I was looking for. So let's see if there are, I have some questions already, but uh, I prefer to see if they are in the chat. Um, so there's a question about the stroke grouping. Um, Yeah, I can read the questions from here if you just want to. Right, it's just yeah. How can we inject? Yeah, I can I can read the question maybe an answer. How can we inject the start principle to sketch understanding interpretation of grouping? Yes. So yes, Gestalt principles give you information about how people perceive groupings. The interesting thing, I guess, is how do we combine those with data, right? Because if you, principles give you kind of this fairly generic opinions on how things happen. Well, what we want is to quantize those. So I think one of the interesting parts is exactly kind of how do you match? And yes, perceptual cues for sketches is kind of one of the big things I discuss a lot or we look a lot in my work. So you can look at those. Again, the challenge is quantizing those and also relating them to the sketching domain because in different domains, different cues become relevant. Is it possible the convention of perception analysis can help design deep waste networks? Yes, absolutely. I totally believe that combining learning and principle is, and those principles is kind of the gold standard going forward. The question is how do we collect enough correct data and integrate those two? And there's a next question. You have mentioned lots of thoughtful insights about how to understand sketches. In your opinion, what insights can also generate to sketches drawn by amateurs? Absolutely. So yeah, I think depending on what types of amateurs, I think there are different types of drawings. I think a lot of draw some drawings may be just purely recognition based, right? I mean, if you ask people to draw a doodle, they do schematics, right? If you draw a human using a circle, a stick, two sticks for hands and two sticks for legs, 
that's really convention based, right? I mean, that's basically because those people had seen others draw humans that way. And that's where at a very large degree this becomes a recognition question. And recognition can be solved based on data. If you have people draw things which are more abstract or more detailed, that's where I think perception can play a role. And again, you want to think about what cues come into play or what tricks in a way people use or kind of even without thinking when they draw. This brings me to this one slide I actually jumped over, which is kind of related to another question which was asked earlier from a previous speaker, is looking at how people draw in 3D. So that's something I didn't talk at all about here, but this is a case of amateurs drawing shapes, though this person is a really a good artist, but not a 3D artist, because I don't think, let's say, I could draw this in 3D, but there are certain things that people do without actually thinking about what they do. And those cues can then become very useful. How do you think the algorithms and reliant perceptual principles can scale to more complex rough drawings? I think, again, you want to do this combination of principles and data. And you want to try, I don't think you can have a single algorithm which solves every type of sketch and every type of drawing. Yuli, I see, is nodding, and I totally agree. I think you want to look at specific spaces. I don't think you can solve, you know, one algorithm solving everything. I think you want to kind of look at different domains and try to see what people do in those domains, even though they don't necessarily think about why they do it. Like one of the things we found very interesting when we interacted with artists is they make certain choices without really thinking in their head about the maths behind those choices. Because artists often don't know maths, but their choices are strongly correlated with human perception. So trying to understand what are the choices made in a particular domain and how they kind of help you interpret sketches in that domain. And Somebody is raising the hand. Do you want to ask your question live? Yeah, if I have time, that'd be great. So uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, very uh, thought-provoking talk. So I really like this uh, human angle uh, that, 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 that you're bringing uh, out. So I think a key question I think facing all of us, uh, doesn't matter if it's in graphics or uh, HCI or vision, is the fact that uh, most people just tell you, I can't draw or I can't sketch. And this then is a major bottleneck towards the you know, sketches being the mainstream and being the the, the default sort of complementary, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, um, mechanism that people use to interact with uh, AI, let's say, right? So, and then your talk really made me thinking, so this is almost like bring some, I might have to come back to you on this. So is at what point do we think about whether the sketch you're drawing now is actually good for the algorithm? So, so, so my, the meta scenario in my mind is this, is it's like, okay, I have this retrieval thing or like in the 3D sort of AR, VR scenario. At what point do we tell the person, hey, you are probably going a bit too far, right? Yeah. So, so I think it's like both, isn't it? Yeah. That's a very interesting question. And I would try to give a few different answers to it. So answer one is I think, yes, we want to ask about the medium people are comfortable drawing in. Because yes, experts can draw wonderful sketches. And so for experts, sketches are the right thing. One of the reasons we had been recently looking at VR interfaces is because we find that even people who are not experts can somehow communicate in VR pretty well. So VR in some ways seems to be a much better equalizer. Mm. The other thing that you are touching on is the quality of the sketch. And that brings us to a very interesting observation, which also kind of come up in some of my work, is that people are much more lenient when your algorithm succeeds on the part of not, not over-interpreting your sketch. So for instance, if I talk about the over-sketching setup, if I go back to it here, sorry, let me just try and get this. Right here. Human beings yeah. Sorry. So if you look at algorithms, people are much more forgiving if you 
do not overinterpret their data. Mm. So let me try and find the drawing here. Sorry, my computer is not communicating. So if you look at something like this, if your algorithm for doesn't cluster yeah, a couple of things screen. you should yeah. have clustered, like let's say if it replaces this cluster here with two strokes instead of one, people go, okay, that's fine. If you, however, let's say, merge the, uh, the pupil with the eye, they get really upset. So one of the things that comes up, I think, when we work on human data is that if people need to do a little bit of extra work after your algorithm is done, they are fine. If they have to undo something your algorithm did, they become really upset. I see. So right. I think that's an interesting kind of bit there to keep in mind. Okay, great. Thank you, Ella. Mm-hmm.